Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Okay. This is our last episode before the hurricane. Great storm. <laughs> we may never hear from John again. But John, it's your turn. So tell us about the story that you picked. I picked a story by N.K. Jemison called Non-Zero Probabilities. And had you read it before? I No, I didn't. I was, re- as of this recording, I'm about to finish the Broken Earth trilogy by her. And okay. it was just such a phenomenal story. And she's such a great writer in those books that I was like, I want to find a a short story by her so I can put her on the podcast. Nice. So I just went to her website and like scrolled through all the short stories she had listed. And um, this one had been nominated for a couple of awards. So I was like, I'll do that one. It was, this was like a long time ago too. Her books are a little more recent. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Her neighbor, the other one, across the hall, helped her figure it out long before the math geeks finished crunching their numbers. Watch, he'd said, and laid a deck of cards face down on her coffee table. There was coffee in the cups with a generous dollop of Bailey's. He was a nice enough guy that Adele felt comfortable offering this. He shuffled it with the blurring speed of an expert, cut the deck, shuffled again, then picked up the whole deck and spread it, still face down. Pick a card. Adele picked the Joker. Only two of those in the deck, he said, then shuffled and spread again. Pick another. She did, and got the other joker. Coincidence, she said. This had been months ago, when she was still skeptical. He shook his head and set the deck of cards aside. From his pocket, he took a pair of dice. He was nice enough to invite inside, but he was still that kind of guy. Check it, he said, and tossed them onto her table. Snake eyes. He scooped them up, shook them, tossed again. Two more ones. A third toss brought up double sixes. At this, Adele had pointed in triumph, but the fourth toss was snake eyes again. These aren't weighted, if you're wondering, he said. Nobody filed the edges or anything. I got these from the bodega up the street, from a pile of shit the old man was tossing out to make more room for food shelves. Brand new, straight out of the package. Might be a bad set, Adele said. Might be, but the cards ain't bad, nor your fingers. He leaned forward, his eyes intent despite the pleasant haze that the Baileys had brought on. Snake eyes, three tosses out of four, and the fourth a double six. That ain't supposed to happen even in a rigged game. Now check this out. Carefully, he crossed the fingers of his free hand. Then he tossed the dice again. Six throws this time. The snake still came up twice, but so did other numbers. Fours and threes and twos and fives. Only one double six. That's batshit, man, said Adele. Yeah, but it works. He was right, and so Adele had resolved to read up on gods of luck and to avoid breaking mirrors, and to see if she could find a four-leaf clover in the weed patch down the block. They sell some in Chinatown, but she's heard their knockoffs. She's hunted through the patch several times in the past few months, once for several several hours. Nothing so far, but she remains optimistic. So what did you like about this story? Well, I liked it for a lot of reasons. I mean, she's just a good writer and yeah. it like presents this whole big situation, but it's very personal right. at the same time. It introduces the situation in a really personal way too. There's no like long disquisition about like the effect on society and like this whole like New York was shuddering under the impact of bad luck, you know, like right. you just get right into like her character and what she's doing in the situation and how she came to realize what was going on and how she's handling it. It and then what happens to her. Right. Which is like, as a writer, you want to explain everything, right? You want to get like, yeah. this is my situation that I want to put out into this story, especially in like speculative fiction where things yeah. are off and you need to like explain it somehow. Being able to just deftly weave it into a character story right. is good. So that was the main thing that jumped out at me. Yeah, this does seem like if you had to categorize it, like speculative fiction would be the term for it. Because like you said, she doesn't spend a whole lot of time at the outset world building or explaining the exact situation. And by the end, at least for me, part of the conclusion was that this is advice for living, whether or not your city has been plagued by bad luck, you know? Yeah, like, absolutely. Bad things are going to happen, but you can't stress about when and why and how and whether you could have avoided them. So you just have to keep living. I think a character actually says that in, in more or less yes. in some way. Yeah. Yeah. it's. I think it's the neighbor guy or whatever guy she's kind of like curious about because yeah. He's the one that's like showing her the snake eyes and the cards and he's like, isn't that wild? And she's like disbelieving at first. But then by the end, he's the one that's like, I mean, yeah, all this shit's going on. But so what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that like blows her mind a little bit. But um, yeah, you're right. So it, it gets into it like really fast. And because there's not this section that explains everything, you just have to kind of guess what's happening. Like, I mean, there's that word on the first page. It's like her Spanish word of the day was suerte, which is luck, you know. And so you're just 
kind of assuming the whole time that that's all it is. There's never anything that explains even why it is. Maybe New Yorkers are being punished. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah, it's just bad luck. But then she also she doesn't really ever articulate this. But the scene and I think it's Central Park, if not Central Park, some park. She's walking and she sees how something could potentially unfold while this kid's like barreling toward like a food cart, and she's thinking the whole time that this food is gonna fly in her face and that the impact is gonna like send her into traffic and she's gonna get hit by a bus and instead like a frisbee catches the food and like she's not hit she's completely spared and she's like freaking out afterwards she's like oh my god i almost died it's like first of all you didn't die almost was what you envisioned in your head but she chalks that up as evidence of terrible things like waiting to get her but by the end i read this story as she is lucky everything she's doing is protecting her it's working yeah the story opens up with like the train going off the tracks at the very beginning and she's avoided that too because she's been walking for months and like she's not even close enough to the impact to like be a innocent bystander at that point you know like yeah that moment with the frisbee and the slushies or whatever that's when she finds a four-leaf clover yeah afterwards yeah she's very exactly she like throws herself on the ground and like oh there it is (laughs) yeah so i don't know that the character ever realizes that and i know i've brought this up in the past if not on the show than in the workshop but i remember writing a story in college and someone saying like that they wish that the change in the character had come from the character themselves and not from some other character in the story and i think that's what's disappointing here is that it takes some dude that she wants to bang to like convince her that there's a new way of living even though like she's been walking through life unscathed up until this point she doesn't have examples of horrible things happening to her she's just worried that they might i get that like some stories have to happen that way where you know an outside force changes the character's perspective but maybe what feels weak about it is that it's like a romantic connection and also that like the act that solidifies this is both of them deciding to have sex even though they're both telling each other they don't have STDs and they're both hoping the condom doesn't break like there's literally that scene where they're like like he rubs a rabbit foot right before they bang like oh my god the improbable is likely to happen in this world so (laughs) yeah they're like (laughs) unless you cross your fingers and (laughs) right but it's only when she's about to get laid that she's like no maybe he's right (laughs) like come on how can you not put this together for yourself well she's living in this world everything around her seems to be having bad luck and she's trying to create this shield around her of like to yeah. keep this good luck not realizing that it's working right right and then she's like you know what actually maybe he has to like say it's working <laughs> yeah i just thought it was kind of funny like she's so stressed this entire time and everything to her seems like the ultimate danger it, like it seems like when she leaves her home she's convinced that something will try to kill her is trying to kill her and then there is that section it says and it's not like the signs are all bad the state had to suspend its lottery program too many winners in one week bankrupted it the Knicks made it to the finals and the Mets won the series a lot of people with cancer went into spontaneous remission and some folks with full-blown AIDS stopped showing any viral load at all there are new tours now double-decker buses full of the sick and disabled Adele tries to tell herself they're just more tourists so there are signs and things that she's had to acknowledge that not everything is bad she could be one of the really good ones it's a matter of luck right yeah the word of the day <laughs> yeah and that's interesting too right that there's good luck and bad luck it's not like curse the word was it's not just curse. the probability non-zero probability is the title right so it's like yeah. anything that's like the chances are pretty low but hey right in new york during this time during whatever's happening here chances might be good yeah the most extreme version of either could happen to you you could be cured of cancer or hit by a bus at the exact moment you arrive or actually hook up with your neighbor yeah right and it's like mm, i don't know how unlikely this really was adele <laughs> Like you said, it gets into it really quickly. And so maybe this is just like a really good example of world building. And Clark's world where this was published is all sci-fi and fantasy. So they, you know, they're used to seeing things like this all the time. And I imagine the worst of it is stuff that spends too long explaining how exciting their imagined world is and not enough time just like showing us who the character is that's moving through it. And yeah. to your point, this launches right into the character. We already know from the first paragraph that she's half Irish, half African that she's learning Spanish, that she doesn't totally believe in all of these like religions, but she's not taking her chances. And then like, there's a bunch of little clues as to the fact that it's, you know, New York City, but also like modern day. And it's things like she's cleaning her laundry with woolite. I mean, it's just really quick. It's that's world building, even though it's not world building to make it that surreal little area that she's created. She's still telling us so much about the place where this character lives. It's not even things that are like big and dramatic too. It's 
like the little comment about she walks in the middle of the street because some people don't bolt their air conditioners. To, yes. You know, the window units in the way they're supposed to be. And so the first reading, you're like, what? And then you realize, oh, because they're falling out onto people. Yeah. I underline that one too. So like the whole world and even little situations like that, that aren't like fantastical or speculative. They're just part of this world. They're just ordinary things that are changed slightly because of the nature of the luck in the world. But you have to kind of infer what's happening. It's just not necessarily yeah. stated outright. Yeah. The I remember when I read this the second time I underlined the AC unit one because I felt like that was a really good example of this fine line between is the city really cursed with extreme good or bad luck? And if that's the case, like when she walks underneath one or near one and it doesn't fall, does she feel like she's extremely lucky? Or is she just waiting for the extreme bad luck? You know what I mean? She's yes, just waiting for the bad for luck. Yeah, to enforce the belief, but she's not looking at all the things that she's dodged necessarily as signs of the good luck that she's encountering. And also I thought that one was interesting because, you know, in some of these other examples, maybe there's human error at fault for even like the train going off the tracks or the kid running into whatever. The wrench. Yeah. And it's like human error that, you know, it's a human factor that people are not bolting these things correctly, but it's also just people don't bolt them correctly, whether or not they try to bolt them correctly. You know, some people might've tried to do it and it's just like a little bit, bit of a mistake or whatever. It's not like this intentional thing. And if it is intentional, then it's like laziness. It's not like luck. And this is an inevitability, whether or not New York is cursed was like my thinking. You know what I mean? This is just like all of these factors are always in place, but it's just that the city is under some kind of crises right now that makes it so that these things are going to come to fruition one way or the other. It's going to tip them all one way or the other. But she should always be worried about the AC is what I was thinking, you know? <laughs> oh, and yeah. I don't think it's that unlikely. There's millions of these things and they're all probably improperly secured. I don't know. It was funny. Like, because the train is a really good example of a very extreme version and the yeah. AC units are everywhere. I do want to say about, I did say, like, you have to infer a lot. It's an interesting balance, I think, when you're writing something that you want to suggest to the reader without stating outright, like, especially as a part of world building, where you want the reader to come to understand that the world works in this way, or there's some small detail about the world, but you don't want to state it outright, maybe because the character doesn't think about it in that way. So you want to stay true to the point of view, or for whatever reason that it's necessary to do that in the story. And what she does is she paints everything else very clearly. Like you have to present things in such a way that when the reader has to make an inference, right. that you put the pieces in that they're going to make the inference you want them to make, not some other inference, right? Right. Yeah. And that's a careful balancing act. And I think one of the reasons that this, like the, the world building specifically that I kind of mentioned at the beginning was the reason that works so well in this is because it's so tied to her experience. So we're learning about her by seeing what she's doing in the world, but what she's doing in the world is also revealing the world around her. And the world around her isn't, it's important because it influences how she's behaving. So that's how we, why we learn about it. But learning about her is more important. So those are the things that are going to be more clear and we have to infer the rest of the world from that. Right. It's like bubbles within bubbles. Yeah. And based on what we've like kind of learned about this character, interpreting most things as her like avoiding bad things instead of like having good luck. It's that added layer where we're not being told that things could just as easily be turning out really well for her. We're also seeing it through her sort of like negative negative point of view. So she is very deftly executing this where by the end, I don't think we're supposed to think that this character is like delusional or anything like that. I think she's likable and that I enjoyed the story and all that. But there's something that the author is doing that's allowing me to realize that she might not be the most reliable narrator in terms of why things are happening to her. You know, yeah. she's built the world up enough and we've inferred enough with the right details to know that this girl is also crippled by this state of the world, like more severely than other people. Her her perception is not necessarily the reality for everyone else. And that's also why like her neighbor's revelation, it's a revelation for her and for us at the same yeah, time. Right. And like her final act of like, she's like hurls her St. Christopher medal out in an airplane, right? Yeah. Like she's like, I don't need all this luck anymore because I've got decent luck. Like luck is taking care of itself in a different way. Right. And presumably she's not going to that little prayer fest. Right. She's like, this world's okay to live in. It's not like a conscious thing. 
it's like the same way that like a lot of endings unravel where you have to like think about what is this like a character takes some action that like kind of shows you right what their internal change is it's the show tell thing again i guess right and we have to understand what has changed within their character because it's not stated outright it's just shown to us yeah i mean like you said we can safely assume by the time she throws that flyer that she's not going to the prayer thing but it's not like completely clear like what she's concluded in her head with that action yeah. like you do we have can to tell of, something has yeah. changed yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's enough and it's also like maybe if we read it again we'd be like okay yeah that does make sense I know I've talked about this like a million times, but because this is speculative fiction, it maybe makes it important to like repeat, you know, but I know that my takeaway for a lot of like sci-fi and fantasy stories has been that these are really fun vehicles and little packages to impart whatever takeaway or lesson you want your reader to have, you know? So I really like that this was a story about whether or not you believe in luck and whether or not you want to live your life fearing what could happen or just like hoping for the best, you know? And she's a careful person, right? She's not having unprotected sex. She's not leaving her house without an umbrella or something. You know what I mean? She's not being unsafe. So in a lot of ways, like she's approaching life the best she can. And now she's just going to let what will happen happen. She's not like one of these people that leaves her house without her wallet and thinks to herself, like, it'll be okay. <laughs> she's a normal person and she's going to take kind of take her chances. But anyway, I, I think that's kind of my takeaway is that we don't know. We never know if N.K. Jameson like started with the premise that the world is extremely lucky or unlucky. We don't know if that's what she started with or if she wanted to explore a character like Adele suffering from either this, the reality and the state of the world or something like OCD. She could be just like a normal person in a normal world that's dealing with this. And for the author's message by the end to be, you gotta just roll with the punches kind of and not really get worked up about what might happen because you'll miss, you know, the good stuff. And this is a familiar lesson, I think. I mean, every Everything I've used to describe it just now feels like a cliche. So <laughs> what's new about it, though, is that it's in this little speculative fiction package where yeah. you're like, is this sci-fi? Is this fantasy? Is this like weird religious undertones? It's all about praying it away. But it's just a cool way to to kind of get the message delivered to you. And it's a memorable world that way. So I don't know. My takeaway would be that you don't have to be this diehard sci-fi person. You don't have to really work too hard to create a world. But even if it's like through a lens of like slight mental illness or weird quirk for a character. Like what if someone with schizophrenia really thinks everyone is after them and then you create a world in which everyone is actually after everyone else, you know? What does that look like? Where you kind of take like a reality and stretch it a little bit further. I remember in a really early episode, I mentioned Daniel Dennett had this and he's talking about philo doing philosophy and like yeah. thought experiments. But he said like you, you find the dials in the thought experiment and you turn them all the way up. So you do like reductios, reductio certain and just see like if you change this variable in this way how does that change the outcome of your thought experiment and i compared that with like writing a story i forget which episode it was i wish i could remember but this is kind of like that like i like you were talking about like what was the impetus for writing this like i can imagine some friend of hers or some or maybe her she herself thought i have such bad luck everything yeah. always goes wrong in my life and yeah. she thought about that and thought about that and was like i'm gonna write a story with someone who thinks they have bad luck and then just twist those dials right yeah it's like right. let's put it in a world where everyone has bad like the worst luck yeah but what happens at the same time with like things that always go wrong there must be the counter balance people where things are always going right and maybe that's not some people it's, it's just all situations so it's right. you know you can see how that comes about just by playing with those dials and i think that like your takeaway that that's a great way to like get to this to speculate about these things right yeah that's it's all it is twist the dials and right. whatever situation it is like like classic romance, the, the meat cute, you know, twist the dials on a meat cute and see what you wind up with. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to phrase it. My takeaway is basically what I said in the beginning about the world building and how you just making it personal, like following the character and watching the character interact with the world reveals the world, but keeps the interest on the character, which is what you want in the story. Like especially a short story, it's you're not going to explore the entire world. A short story is usually confined to a character right. and whatever's happening to that character in the 
immediate kind of immediate situation. So this is just shows us how easy it is to build a really complicated world, a really big situation around a character, but maintain that focus on that single character. I think you can extend that beyond mere speculative world building. Yeah. Where you have to show us the things that have that are not normal about the world. Right. Like, you know, Hemingway with the iceberg thing, like he's in a short story he's showing us Paris or Africa or something, but he's giving us only the briefest details about that because he's Hemingway and that's what he does. But you're st- you're still focusing on the character, but you feel a bigger world around him because he's picking the right, right details. It's always he always comes back to picking the right details, right? Yeah, to make this world believable and to come to life around the character. But yeah, we're picking the right details to make it feel authentic, but we're also picking just the bare minimum because we don't have time to explain to you how this entire world works and it doesn't matter. You just need a grasp of it. Thinking about it through the lens of turning up the dials to speculate on certain things, I imagine I could like go through our entire catalog of stories that we've read and like reclassify them as like a type of speculative fiction versus like, oh yeah, you know, things that feel like sci-fi or things that you wouldn't even describe as anything other than like a real world story. Think about Nabokov's Spring and Fialta, right? Like you've twisted the dial on his obsession with this woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's even elements in that one. Like you talked about like twisting the dial on a meat cute where he's thinking to himself like, oh, I ran into her again. It's yeah. like, no, you, you engineered that and you knew what you were doing. Yeah. Maybe a common theme there then would also be like these unreliable narrators, these like unhinged <laughs> sort of main characters that are misinterpreting things around themselves like for their own benefit, sort of. I hate that guy. Why'd you bring him up? Oh, or um, another one you, you love very much, the Snows of Kilimanjaro, Hemingway's story. Like you're twisting the dial on his um kind of denial, his like uh, denial of reality. He's like, oh God, everyone's going to miss me. My poor wife, my poor wife. I cheated on her in the entirety of our relationship. She's so sad now. And the woman he's with is like, oh, he's going to die. <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh, Oh, darn, I'm stuck here in Africa <laughs> with all of this money. That is kind of what any, like, even literary fiction, non-speculative stuff is like, you're really trying to drill in on a feeling or drill in on an idea or, or some, whatever it is that's yeah. like guiding a character, a person, a human experience. In order to get to that, you kind of do have to twist those dials and you got to like heighten the levels a little right. bit to make it engaging and interesting. Yeah. There's like a, probably a point on the dial where it becomes so heightened that it's war. And then it's speculative or it's, I don't know, an acid trip. (laughs) (laughs) Which brings us to our next story. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at NaplesWritersWorkshop.com.